Right. So my, um, so yeah, my family's been here, and I, they're, they were definitely first, first wave, if you can even call it a wave. I think they were more like first ripple Mexican. The church, the um, Spanish chapel, which is a, uh, a church at 19th and Spring Garden, it's a Mexican, um, uh, well, it's a Spanish language church that is part of the, uh, the archdiocese. And basically, there were no masses in Spanish. And uh, you know, back then, and so uh, folks wanted it. They lobbied the church. The church didn't want it. They raised the money. They bought the building. You know, the community themselves bought the you know the first uh, building, and then you know the the church got on board. And that church is still there, and it's it's definitely a special place. Everyone in the family has been pretty much baptized, weddings, and funerals in that little tiny church. Wow. And so, but uh, folks in my family are not super. They're, they're pretty practical people, you know, and so there's, there's some challenges with the church, you know, I think that, that folks see that. <laughs> so there's a lot about the Catholic faith that is very comforting, like the physical place of the church. Whenever I travel, my partner and I, whenever we travel, we like to visit churches because usually they're, um, they're, they're beautiful, right? There's usually like a lot of really awesome artwork yeah. in churches um, and, uh, and they're free. You can always go into church for free and usually um, nice and cool in there, um, you know? But you can tell a lot about like, what, the, what the place was like by the, by the church. My family wasn't so much in support of the fact that I was turning down these offers, right? They're like, this is a great opportunity. And you know, it was one of the first uh, people in my family to, who would go away to college. We have a lot of folks who did the community temple route, um, but you know, it's definitely gonna be the first one to go away. And, um, and so my family wasn't really in favor of that decision. Um, and so, you know, I was like, well, I'm paying for it myself. I'm gonna pay for it myself then. And uh, so I went to Westchester because it was state school, it was affordable, and I could pay for it myself. So I came out um, to myself when I was 17, right? So I graduated high school, um, 17, and I started school that summer. I started school in a, a pre-program. A pre, um, and so I started literally four days after graduation from high school. And um, it was a group of us, it was about, um, I think it was about 120 of us who went through the summer program, um, which was really cool. And we got to take a bunch of our uh, classes um, that summer. So we kind of had to jump, we knew where everything was, and we kind of had friends already. Um, you know, I think up till uh, that time, I just really didn't, I wasn't interested in, in boys, but I didn't have a articulated, identity really you know like you'd see girls crying at their locker in high school and I just remember thinking that's so stupid why would you do that like you know that's so stupid why is she crying at her locker um, you know but then when I was in my first year of college you know I you know had an experience where I was like oh I get it I want to go cry at my locker now right uh, but the deal was I just hadn't really experienced that level of, of feeling so I, I came out when I was 17 and um, to myself, I wasn't um, super out right away. Um, you know, came out to my mom, um, but we kind of slowly came out to other family members, stuck to my, like, cl my younger cousins first, and then kind of worked up to the older relatives, you know. And, um, you know, and so that was, that kind of happened all throughout um, college. And then when I was, doing the activism um, and community organizing work, which I started to do in my second year, after my second year of college. So my last two years, it was pretty much my focus um, of work. There was a lot of queer people um, doing um, work. I mean, there always is a lot of queer people in activism and community organizing. Um, so that was, that was cool. You know, it was just like, it was, it was, um, it's, it was, it was interesting to see that the, um, all these different people, right? And so um, I remember on campus, we had, Westchester had a um, LGBT student group already. Um, in the, in the, this was, I started in 89 and graduated in 93. So that was kind of early to have a campus group at a state school, yeah. right? Uh, there wasn't a lot of them. And I had had it um, on campus for some time. It was mostly, I saw it as a support group and I was kind of self-righteous. I was like, I don't need support. You know, I don't need that group. So I wasn't active with them. I was active in student government. Um, I ran the Latino Student Union. Um, and that was probably a part of the reason why, like, like you can only do so much, right? Um, and I was really visible as a Latino student leader on campus. And um, my last year, 
um, I kind of pushed us to like make strategic alliances with, you know, the last couple of years the, for the like the second and third year we made really strong relationships with the um, the BSU, the Black Student Union, and then um, my last year I really pushed it that we need to like have. We, we all the student groups we need to be united and so we need to make friends with the gay student union blah, blah, and so but that was like a stretch you know what I mean but folks kind of did it I mean I think at that point I was persuasive as a leader and um, and I was out to the other leaders of those groups um, but I, I wasn't a member of like the gay student union on campus because um, you know I didn't need support <laughs>well, I think it definitely helped that um, I came out through political work, right? Um, and the kind of work that I was doing, it was, um, you know, in, in doing work with poor people and about poor people's issues, um, there's kind of like a couple camps of people who kind of come through that work. There's the people who um, are benevolent and like want to feed people, right? And maybe they're coming from a faith um, perspective, right, and um, charity, you know, and uh, being charitable. Um, there are folks like myself who came from a political perspective, and we were much more self-righteous, right? Um, but, you know, the folks that we saw who were coming, you know, wanting to feed people, and, you know, we called it like the band, like putting band-aids, you know, we're looking for grassroots change, you know, systemic, and, you know, these band-aid people, um, they were doing important things because maybe somebody wouldn't eat that day, you know, but, um, but, you know, the folks who were doing that kind of stuff, you know, we kind of saw them as not being true to themselves, right? So there was definitely, like, there was something that I needed to see reflected um, in myself, and, like, and that kind of helped, you know, right? Because it, it, the benevolence, I kind of saw it as, like, um, that's not going to sustain you, you know, for the long haul, like, kind of really knowing why you're there. Um, you know, it can't only be, you know, in your head, like, uh, um, you know, um, but kind of, you know, knowing that it's about you. And I think um, that's why I kind of gravitated towards the things that were more, um, where I saw more queer people, right? Because I was like, okay, I don't really see myself in this way reflected in the uh, welfare rights work, you know? Um, you know, I was coming out as a queer person, but I didn't really see, like, the work that we were doing was, um, you know, the sort of, identity in that regard was sort of like secondary to like other survival issues that people were navigating and um, you know and so there was some pitting of issues that happened and that's hard but uh, you know, so I think I wanted to be involved and one of the things that I I really wanted to be connected to was queer people and so, um, so that's why I wanted to like find the, the sort of queer organizing that was happening. And so that's why I was really enamored with ACT UP and um, the really cool work that was happening around reproductive health because it, it was all, it was largely queer people doing it mm -hmm. and which was um, really exciting in that, in that way. They rolled with it. I mean, I think, um, so my mom, She's kind of like a little bit of the freak of the family, right? She, um, she's artistic, she's an artist, um, she's a free thinker, um, and she's kind of different than a lot of the other folks in the family. Our family's really close-knit, um, and so she's, her creativity and difference in that way was always just kind of accepted um, because she, she was her own person in that way. Of course, when she was growing up, it was hard, like, creative women of her generation it was you just you, she married late like you know like she was in her late 20s when she had me like everybody has their kid like if you were 23 when you got married like you were an old maid you know so she was 26 when she had me and so that was like you know kind of really pushing it um so, but so she's kind of always operated outside the box and so I think um you know because I was her daughter, I kind of got a free pass. Like I was her daughter. So I didn't really have um, the same kind of expectations that maybe some of my cousins had, my older cousins maybe. Um, you know, because I was a free thinker, like she, you know, she didn't like push the gender toys, you know, like, you know, she, whereas for other folks in my family, like it would have not been acceptable to get a racetrack set for a girl, you know, but it was totally cool for me, you know, um, 
my mom also had a lot of gay male friends when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. uh, and because she, you know, she did clothing and makeup. And, and so, you know, like it was a natural, you know, allegiance. Um, my mom is very Liz Taylor White Diamond. So gay men love her. And um, so she always has had, she had, um, well, she lost some friends during uh, AIDS, during that time of AIDS. But, um, you know, she always had a lot of gay men in her life. They, they were probably as much um, positive male role figures as um, my grandfather, her dad, was like my positive role, male role figure. I, I don't have the same expectations. I did things differently. I never asked folks for money. Mm -hmm. um, I was really independent. And so I didn't have the things that like, when people give you money, they feel like they can tell you what to do. So I didn't have that. Um, and so that I think helped. But my family is also very accepting. Um, they were, they've been very accepting and, um, you know, certainly there's, there are definitely certain family members who we operate in under a don't ask, don't tell policy, you know, um, you know, certainly my grandmother, she died, um, a couple years ago, three years ago, going on three years ago. Um, she was very religious, you know, and, um, you know, people make anti-gay comments you know, and she had definitely made some. But, um, you know, in her last year, she retired out to Texas, where my family's originally, originally from. She was born here in Philadelphia, but she retired out there. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, she's my grandmother. And um, she might have been hateful in one way or another, but she's my grandmother, mm -hmm. you know. And, um, you know, I mean, it is, I, I made several trips out there to visit her before she passed away. And, um, and I'm glad I did. Like, I'm glad I didn't let the expectations that she had or the things that she said um, have an impact, you know. Um, I think, you know, kind of being an only child really does, um, it helped me. Because I didn't have anybody else's, I didn't have another model to model myself after, right? Um, only children, like, we're our own people, right? Because we don't have like an older sister or an older brother, right? To kind of model ourselves after. Um, so in that way, I think that's really kind of helped me be my own person, right? Um, but again, I think it also has helped that I've been independent. You know, I always, I have a family that would literally do anything for me, um, you know, and, um, and I know that. Um, but I also, I also know that I've never really taken anything um, to accept, you know, like people, like family members have helped me greatly. You know, my aunt, I lived with her, my great aunt. So I don't, I probably, you know, would have really struggled, you know, um, and I did. I mean, I did struggle, like I ate my ramen noodles. I did all that <laughs> stuff, but like, you know, but buying books, you know, um, that was a lot. I didn't necessarily have the cash. So like my family has always stepped up, even if they didn't agree with me um, and that's I think um, that's a really great thing to have um, so that's a you know I, I don't ever forget that you know that part because yeah. um, you know